right. Uh, I think we can get started. Um, and we have now we have um, over 20 um, attendees. And I'm sure some people are coming um, in the last very minute. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to ASIC seminar series. Um, I'm John, the seminar coordinator. I will be the moderator together with um, our communication specialist, Kathy Medney. Uh, so, just so you know that the seminar is being recorded and to, it will be later published on our YouTube channel. Uh, so, please feel free to check it out later. And um, today, we are honored to have our speaker, Professor um, Aditi Shradri with us. And um, let me give you a brief introduction about the uh, speaker. So, um, Professor Sh Shradi is an assistant professor in the Department of Earth System Science at Stanford University. She is also affiliated with Stanford Woods Institute for the Environmental um, Study and he's a center fellow. He was a junior fellow of the Simon Foundation in New York and a postdoc research scientist at Columbia University's Department of Applied Physics and her Applied Maths and the Neyman Dorsey Earth Observatory, hosted by Professor Lorenzo Pavani. Um, she received um, her PhD in Amherst Physics Science from MIT, um, where he worked with um, Professor Adam Plapp. Um, and Professor um, Shradi is broadly interested in atmosphere and ocean dynamics, climate variability, and general circulation. She is particularly in, um, interested in fundamental questions in atmospheric dynamics. She tackles these topics uh, using a combination of theory, observation, and both idealized and comprehensive numerical experiments. Um, her current area of focus include the dynamics variability and the change of the mid latitude jets and storm tracks and the stratospheric um, polar vortex. So let's uh, welcome the speaker and um, Professor, I'm going to turn this over to you. Um, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, John. Uh, thanks everyone for showing up. Um, I am so pleased to be able to give the seminar. And I'm sorry not to be there in person, but presumably the situation will be fixed. Well, goodness knows when, but um, I'm excited to tell you about everything that I'm going to present today is really very, very new stuff. Um, and we've been thinking about atmospheric gravity waves for a couple of years in my group. Um, so improving both our understanding of atmospheric gravity waves, uh, their sources, their uh, propagation, where they break. Um, and also importantly, how they are uh, represented in these global climate models where uh, they cannot be explicitly resolved. So that's what much of my talk is gonna be about. I have a little bit about something else at the end of the talk, but let's see how the first bit goes. Um, I expect it to completely fill up the uh, 45 minutes. So, oh no, my slides aren't advancing. There we go. Okay. So, as I said, in the first part of my talk, uh, I'm going to be focused on atmospheric gravity waves or buoyancy waves. Um, and I'm going to tell you about various things that are happening in my group to sort of improve, to, to hopefully transform both our understanding of gravity waves as well as uh, gravity wave uh, parameterizations for these uh, global climate models. In the first part of my talk, I will introduce a completely data-driven or a machine learning uh, gravity wave parameterization, which we developed and then coupled back to a uh, climate model. And we've shown that it's doing reasonably well in terms of being accurate as well as uh, stable when it's brought online, so coupled to the uh, climate model. In the second part of my talk, I'm gonna tell you about some very new stuff um, that my postdoc is working on to include estimates. The hope is to include estimates of uh, parametric uncertainty in uh, climate projections, again, applied to uh, gravity wave parameterization. So uncertainty quantification, so calibration and uncertainty quantification of these parameters associated with uh, gravity wave parameterizations. 
Um, following which, I'll so show you some snapshots of some really new observations from these Loon balloons. So Loon uh, came out of Google X, and uh, their idea was to provide internet access to everyone beneath these balloons. But incidentally, they also um, captured a lot of really valuable new data about the upper atmosphere, so the upper troposphere and the uh, lower stratosphere. Um, so why don't I just jump into all of this, and then if we get through the gravity wave part, I wanted to tell you about a paper that I had accepted a few months ago um, in GRL, uh, which talks about what sets the window of accuracy of, uh, of, of, of uh, weather predictions and how that may change in different climates. So let me just jump into it. Um, atmospheric gravity waves or buoyancy waves are really quite ubiquitous in the atmosphere where they form from a variety of processes, including flow over orography, moist convection, geostrophic adjustment of jets, eddy eddy interactions. Um, there's a whole host of processes which force uh, gravity waves in the atmosphere. Crucially, some of these processes that force gravity waves are themselves parameterized in uh, climate models. Here is a Hoffmuller diagram. This is at the equator um, up at uh, 60 hectopascal, and this is U on the left and V on the right. And these little fluctuations that you see in the Hoffmuller diagram, both on the left and the right, um, are observations of, uh, well, if you think of reanalysis as something like observations, these are ECMWF winds showing you uh, small fluctuations in U and V close to the equator. So gravity waves are a really interesting example of the multi-scale nature of atmospheric flow. So gravity waves, much of the spectrum of uh, gravity waves is not resolved in a climate model grid box, which you can think of as being about 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers. Uh, gravity waves now vary on length scales between say tens of kilometers to 10 to the five kilometers. So they vary all the way from really tiny length scales to planetary length scales. And uh, much of the spectrum, as I just said, is not resolved in a climate model grid box. Um, despite the fact that they vary on small length scales, as well as sometimes have very high frequencies, they are crucial in atmospheric dynamics. So they affect global things like the uh, jet stream. Uh, we think that they, uh, that they play a significant role in setting the momentum budget of the jet stream, so its variability. And they're really first order in terms of understanding the middle atmosphere. So anything um, the uh, uh, stratosphere and above. Uh, and I am a stratospheric uh, dynamicist. And so I think a lot about what's happening with the polar vortex and things like that. And so understanding uh, the contribution of the breaking of gravity waves is first order in the uh, stratosphere in things like uh, 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 stratospheric sudden warmings. It drives the QBO, uh, it drives uh, threshold processes such as cloud formation, and these subtropical and tropical low clouds, we think, um, are driven quite a bit by these uh, gravity waves, and they're a huge source of uncertainty in uh, climate projection. Now, gravity waves themselves um, contribute to this large uncertainty in uh, climate projection that keeps many of us up at night. And um, as we've already said, gravity waves have to be parameterized in climate models because they cannot explicitly be resolved. Um, and what a parameterization is, it, it, it's just a fancy way of saying that there is a black box, which tells you what the effect of gravity waves are in a grid box in terms of variables that can be resolved. So that's what a, a, a parameterization is. Um, current gravity wave parameterizations have various shortcomings. All uh, gravity wave parameterizations in, uh, in, in, in uh, climate models are single column. So gravity waves are only allowed to propagate just straight up. Whereas, of course, in reality, they do propagate horizontally over thousands of kilometers. Um, gravity wave parameterizations in models are not observationally validated. And they also depend on under-resolved sources, um, such as convection, which is itself parameterized. So this is a bit of a problem. And just to show you exactly how much of a problem it could be in uh, climate projection, this is a figure from Sigmund and Sonoka back in 2010. This is the uh, Canadian climate model, but I imagine any other climate model would be about equivalent. What we're looking at is the change in mean sea level pressure over the Arctic. Uh, on the left and the center are two different versions of the model with two equally defensible choices of uh, gravity wave parameters. 
and the one on the right is the difference between these two. Um, so this is the uh, climate change response to a doubles to a doubling of CO2. Um, and what we're looking at is a change in uh, sea level pressure. So the point I'm trying to make here is that with equally defensible gravity wave parameterizations, you get vastly different changes in something that's as basic as uh, sea level pressure, both in the sign, as you can see, as well as in the magnitude of the change. And so the situation is, um, this is what it is. Um, and, and so I think that this is an area that is really ripe for new research, uh, both in terms of new observations, in terms of possibly new methods, as well as um, uncertainty quantification, which I think is an important aspect of um, of uh, GCM development and, um, and uh, climate projection. So again, for today, I'm gonna to tell you about three ways in which my group is attempting to tackle this problem. Uh, in the first part of my talk, I will introduce a completely data-driven uh, gravity wave parameterization. So we took out the conventional gravity wave parameterization and built up a, uh, a, a neural network representation of the effects of gravity waves on the mean flow. Uh, the ultimate goal with this, of course, is to train the uh, gravity wave parameterization on uh, diverse sources of data. So including new observations, in, including high resolution simulations and so on. But for now, I'll just tell you that we've developed a ML-based uh, gravity wave parameterization, and I will talk you through what went into that and um, uh, how it behaves when it's coupled to, to a uh, climate model. Um, if you have any questions at any point, I would be most comfortable if you just put your hand up and or, or just unmute yourself and interrupt me. Um, that's way better than having to wait uh, for 45 minutes. All right, so um, I don't see any hands up or anything, so I'll just jump into uh, the first part of my talk. So, as I said, the first part of my talk is going to be sort of a proof of concept. Uh, we are going to come up with a uh, machine learning based gravity wave parameterization. And we're going to do it in sort of an idealized complexity GCM. This is not a full GCM uh, for reasons of uh, computational efficiency. We came up with a GCM that is just as complicated as it needs to be for our purpose. Um, this is a model called MEMA, so it's the model of an idealized moist atmosphere. It has interactive uh, uh, radiation and, 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 and interactive water vapor. We are running it at 2.5 by 2.5 degrees, so T42 uh, spectral resolution with 40 levels in the vertical. Uh, MEMA is based on the GFTL model, so it's sort of like AM4. It, it, it just doesn't have quite all of the uh, uh, bells and whistles. Importantly, it has implemented within it uh, the Alexander and Dunkerton uh, gravity wave parameterization, and I'm going to refer to this one as AD99 for the rest of the talk. And what AD99 does is that it mimics the time and space average defect of many discrete intermittent uh, gravity wave packets. And so it just does this by adding a forcing term to the momentum equation. So all it does it is, is that it gives you a drag in the uh, zonal direction and a drag in the uh, meridional direction. If you want to read more about the model, uh, Martin Yuka, who developed it, has um, a nice GitHub and a couple of papers documenting this model development. So you can think of it as an intermediate complexity DCM. It's still global. Um, it's it's got much of the complexity that we need for this specific problem. Um, and here is the architecture of the ANN that we are going to replace Alexander and uh, Dunkerton with. So just to back up a little bit, we want to see if a, uh, a machine learning scheme can do about as well as the Alexander and uh, Dunkerton parameterization just as a start. Um, ultimately, of course, we, we will be training on more complicated data, but for now, we're just going to be training the, the, uh, the, the ANN on the model itself. So uh, this is the architecture of the ANN. We have two separate ANNs, one for the zonal direction and one for the uh, uh, meridional gravity wave tendencies. And we are going to give as input variables to the ANN everything that we can think of, all the, uh, the result flow variables. So 8099 is a single column model, just like every other uh, uh, gravity wave parameterization out there. And we give our ANN, so we call our ANN WaveNet. It's a, it's just a nice, easy, catchy name. Uh, so I'm going to call the ML-based parameterization WaveNet from uh, for the uh, rest of this talk. 
So we give WaveNet uh, all of the input variables, all of the uh, flow variables that are resolved by the model, including zonal wind, uh, meridional wind, the uh, vertical wind, temperature, uh, the location, so latitude, longitude, and altitude, and also the sea level pressure. I'll also show you some results later on on giving it some subset of these variables, but for now, uh, we just give it everything that, that, that we can think of. And the ANM just outputs a vertical column with two numbers. One is the drag in the zonal direction and one is the drag in the meridional direction. So it's uh, 40 vertical levels of two numbers. That's all you get out of this. And for those of you that um, are sort of familiar with ML stuff, uh, it's got a very large number of total trainable parameters. So it's a pretty complex ANN. There's also an analysis of uh, complexity in the associated paper, if you want to read a, a bit more about it. Um, let me cut a very long story short and just tell you that WaveNet does pretty well in terms of emulating the drag that is uh, uh, coming out of NEMA. So what we're looking at here is um, the zonal gravity wave drag on the top and the meridional gravity wave drag at the bottom. This is at 100 hectopascal. So sort of the entrance to the uh, stratosphere, and we've got WaveNet on the left, 8099, so the conventional physics-based uh, gravity wave parameterization on the right, and the center is the difference. And uh, so I'm showing you a video because it's nice to look at, but then you can also look at R squared values and uh, look at exactly how accurately WaveNet is performing um, vis-a-vis 8099, and WaveNet does really quite well. Um, WaveNet also is intriguingly able to generalize uh, to situations on, on which it wasn't trained. So uh, WaveNet, for now, has been trained at only one annual cycle of output. So we've given it only 12 months of output of uh, gravity wave drag from 8099. Um, and here on the top is showing you what 8099 is doing in terms of the drag. Uh, this is close to the equator now, so this is the drag that is associated with the uh, QBO, and at the bottom is what WaveNet is doing. So, intriguingly, when WaveNet is only trained on one year of drag, uh, which only contains one phase of the QBO, WaveNet is able to both complete the second phase of the QBO as well as reinitiate the oscillation. So, that's what I'm showing you here. Uh, uh, WaveNet, however, does overdo the drag a little bit in these places that I pointed out in circles, but it is promising that WaveNet is able to both uh, initiate, so when trained on only the westerly phase of the, of the uh, QBO, it is able to initiate the easterly phase as well as reinitiate another cycle of the oscillation. So it appears that WaveNet is somewhat generalizable to, to uh, situations in which it wasn't trained. Um, we, we hope that that is coming from something that is physically meaningful. We have attempted to take apart this WaveNet uh, uh, using Shapley values, so to look at how interpretable it is. And that is a way of just giving it different sets of combinations of parameters to see the incremental value of adding an additional parameter. And it seems like WaveNet is doing, is, is, is hopefully learning something like a dispersion or uh, a relationship, and so uh, it 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 seems to do pretty well when only trained on the winds above and below the level of interest. That's in the paper. I uh, highly recommend that you check it out. So here's a bit of that analysis. Um, and what we're doing here in the different colors is giving WaveNet different combinations of input variables. So the blue on the extreme right is when we feed to WaveNet everything that we can think of. So everything from uh, zonal to uh, the winds in all directions, the height, the latitude, the temperature, the surface pressure, everything. So that's on the right. And all of these different colors are when we input to WaveNet different combinations of input parameters. Um, I'll just point out that the red over here is the uh, uh, zonal drag when WaveNet is trained only with the zonal mean zonal wind. And similarly, the purple on this side is when the meridional drag is output from a scheme that is only trained on the V winds. Um, I'll point you to this table now and say that WaveNet performs reasonably accurately. So if you want a performance of about 0.9, 
it uh, gets you pretty much there if you just train it on the zonal wind for the zonal drag and if you just train it on the meridional wind for the meridional drag. Um, and again, we've taken this apart in some detail in the paper. Uh, it's in the appendix. Um, so, so we we hope that what WaveNet has learned is something that is physically meaningful in terms of actually depositing the drag uh, where it should. So, all of the results that I've been showing you thus far have been sort of offline performance. So, how well is WaveNet doing at emulating the drag that is generated by AD ninety nine? Many such attempts to parameterize things using uh, using an, an, an ML based approach have fallen apart once you try and couple the ML algorithm with AGCM. Um, not so with us, it would appear. So we use um, we use an interoperability package called FourPy to couple MEMA that is written in uh, Fortran to uh, WaveNet that is of course written in Python. And um, we've done a whole bunch of experiments in which we have thrown out the 8099 parameterization and replaced it with WaveNet. And so WaveNet is now coupled and running online with MEMA. Uh, this is a snapshot of the 30 year uh, of 30 years of a hundred year long integration. Mm -hmm. So at the top is the zonal mean zonal wind from MEMA coupled with 8099. So just the uh, conventional uh, gravity wave parameterization. This is average between 5 south and 5 north. So it's in the region of the QBO again. Um, so 8099 coupled with, with uh, MEMA gives us a spontaneous QBO, so a self-generated QBO with a period of about 28 months um, and west of the amplitude of about 48 meters a second. Uh, at the bottom is the same thing, but it is MEMA now coupled with WaveNet. So this is uh, the online ML uh, gravity wave parameterization. So the good news is that WaveNet appears to be accurate and it is stable when it is run online. So we've been able to complete hundreds of years of integration where at each where the uh, where the MEMA model calls WaveNet instead of calling 8099 each time it needs uh, uh, gravity wave drags. Of course, the model is slowed down by a factor of about two and a half, which is unacceptable, but we think that uh, there's ways forward on that, and I'm happy to talk more about that. So uh, there is a spontaneous QBO when MEMA is coupled with WaveNet, which is what I'm showing you here at the bottom. Uh, the period of the QBO uh, it seems to be reasonable, I mean, within the uh, standard deviation. So it's about 30 months um, with uh, WaveNet and MEMA. MEMA uh, coupled with WaveNet sort of overestimates the westerly amplitude of the QBO, which is more like 57 meters a second versus 48. So that's no longer within the uh, internal variability. But it does give you a QBO and it gives you a reasonable period of a QBO. And uh, um, if you recall that WaveNet was only trained in one phase of the QBO, uh, this, this, this uh, doesn't seem so bad. Uh, we also have some really promising and potentially intriguing results that suggest that WaveNet is generalizing reasonably well to a completely different climate. So um, we played around with a quadruple CO2 climate, and I'll walk you through each of these panels. Uh, so on the top is just MEMA coupled with 8099, so just the conventional uh, GFDL kind of a model response to uh, quadruple CO2. On the left is the control, on the right is the uh, quadruple CO2. And the things that I'd, I'd like you to focus on is a slight forward shift of the jets, of course, in both hemispheres in the troposphere. And um, MEMA, when coupled with 8099, also gives us a slight intensification of the westerlies in both polar vortices. Um, it's a bit stronger, I would say, in the Antarctic than in the Arctic uh, polar vortex. Now, the central panels are the difference in the response of 8099 versus WaveNet. Um, so this is, this is again, both models are online. One is calling 8099 as the uh, gravity wave parameterization and the other is calling WaveNet instead of 8099. Um, on the left is the difference in the behavior of the model um, in the control climate. And uh, Zach, my student has, um, highlight the areas that are not significant. And so you want to focus on the areas which are colored, which are significant. So in the case of the control climate, 8099 um, 
the differences between AD99 and WaveNet appear to be in the tropical upper stratosphere and potentially also pretty high up in the polar vortices in both hemispheres. The differences are rather small. Uh, on the right is the difference between AD99 and WaveNet in a quadruple CO2 kind of a climate. The differences are sort of enhanced. They are particularly so like really high up, just, just below the sponge of the, of the model. But again, the differences are not that huge, and I think that this is encouraging. Uh, at the bottom is the CO2 response. Uh, so uh, quadruple CO2 minus the uh, uh, present day sort of a climate. This is with 8099 on the left and WaveNet on the right. Um, so WaveNet appears to be able to generalize into a completely different climate that it has never seen. So it does give us a slight forward shift of the jets in both hemispheres. It does give us um, a, a slight intensification of the westerlies in both polar vortices. However, uh, there are some differences even in the low to mid stratosphere in the northern hemisphere vortex um, in 8099, which WaveNet is unable to capture. Um, However, we do think that any amount of uh, generalizability is kind of encouraging. Um, I'll stop talking about this particular piece of work now, but I do encourage you to check out this paper. This is uh, my master student, Zach Espinosa's first paper. Um, I think it's quite a nice effort. It, uh, it's in GIL. And I'm happy to talk more about any of this if anyone's interested. So how am I doing? It's 1128. All right. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about some of our efforts on the uh, gravity wave front now. And um, one of the things that we would really like in terms of a parameterization for a future, um, for, for a better thought out gravity wave parameterization would be to include estimates of, of parameter uncertainty in our climate projections. So currently, calibration and um, calibration as well as uncertainty quantification is sort of done by hand in terms of uh, climate models, and so we are unable to span as much of a space of parameters as would be possible. And um, there are standard methods that would lead to many, 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 many forward integrations that you would need in order to put in decent estimates of, 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 of uncertainty with projections. So, uh, so I thought I would introduce some very new work that my postdoc Laura Mansfield has been working on to include um, estimates of uncertainty quantification into a gravity wave parameterization. We are sticking with NEMA and 8099, so it's the same model that I've already introduced and the same uh, gravity wave parameterization that I've already introduced, but here's like a little bit more detail. So the way that 8099 treats a gravity wave event is that it defines a spectrum of, of, of uh, momentum flux um, as a function of the phase speed. So that's what this here looks like. And I'll point out this parameter CW, which is the half width of the phase speeds in the tropics. Um, so 8099 also has an intermittency factor, which is represented by uh, this, this expression over here. And uh, crucially, in this intermittency factor, there is a BTEC that I will point out, which is the total gravity wave stress at the equator. Uh, larger values of this parameter indicate that these events are more intermittent. Um, you don't need to worry too much about these, but I'll say that these are the two parameters that we, that, that we are going to be playing around with in the next 10 or 15 minutes of this talk. Uh, one is the half width of the tropics, and one is the total gravity wave stress in the tropics. Uh, both of these are parameter values that are set in 8099, so they're just given one number and the model is, uh, is, is, is integrated forward. So we are going to see what range of values of this half width and the total, uh, total gravity wave stress at the equator give us something that could be considered a reasonable QBO. So we're going to come up with a mapping of uh, QBO parameters, which I will uh, just think of as a period and an amplitude of the QBO as a function of these parameters that go into this uh, gravity wave parameterization. So that's what's written down over here. So you can think of Y, so the output that, we're, that we are trying to optimize um, as two things. One is the period of the QBO and the other is the amplitude of the QBO. And you can think of this theta, so the, the uh, range of parameters that we are looking at as just two parameters. One is the half width of the tropics and one is the uh, total gravity wave stress in the tropics. 
this method does accommodate internal variability of the model, uh, which goes into this term over there. So I'll talk you through the method. It's been used in a couple of other uh, um, of other uh, contexts prior to this, but it's still relatively new. So I'll talk you through the method a little bit. Um, so this is known as the calibrate emulate sample. Um, there has been a couple of papers. I would refer you to this one in the Journal of Computational Physics for, for uh, some of the detail. This has been done in the context of uh, um, convective parameterization uh, and the KPP parameterization for, for ocean convection. Um, so here's a paper uh, that points to some of that. But let me just talk you through the calibrate, the emulate, and the sample. So in the first step, we are going to calibrate the parameters to something that we're going to uh, call the truth using a method call, called ensemble common inversion. Um, in what I'm going to present, we are going to use a long run of MEMA as the truth, but one could uh, calibrate to observations, one could uh, calibrate to um, high resolution simulations or whatever one wants, basically. But we use ensemble common inversion to calibrate our two parameters, so the half width in the tropics and the uh, total gravity wave stress in the tropics to something that is the truth. So uh, we are just going to use a period and a frequency of the QBO from a long MEMA integration. We are then going to build a Gaussian process emulator, which maps choices of the uh, parameter values onto things that we want to optimize, so the period and the amplitude of the QBO. Um, and it does so in a computationally feasible manner. It doesn't involve many forward integrations of the model. In fact, we use the same integrations that were set up in the uh, calibrate step. And once we've set up this very the, this this emulator, which cheaply maps the parameters onto the outputs, we can sample the space using a, a, a Markov chain Monte Carlo process, um, and and produce a posterior distribution of these parameters. So if this doesn't seem particularly clear yet, I will now talk you through exactly what we did in terms of uh, the eighty ninety nine parameterization implemented into MEMA. Let me just jump into that, assuming my slides advanced. There we go. Okay, so this is the uh, calibration step. So once again, we use a perfect model, which is just a long integration of MEMA. And for this long integration of MEMA, we've picked a couple of these parameters, which give us a reasonable uh, QBO period, um, which is 24 months in this case, um, and a QBO amplitude of 27 meters per second. Uh, these were chosen to uh, to give us reasonable climatologies both in the tropics as well as in the extratropics. But as I said, this is just this is just what we assumed is the truth. You can use anything as a truth, including um, observations, which is uh, something that Laura, my postdoc, is working on. And at each iteration of this ensemble common inversion, uh, the the process sets off an ensemble of MEMA integrations. Each ensemble is run for 10 years, and we go through nine iterations of the, of the ensemble common inversion. And we are tuning to get a QBO period and amplitude to, uh, to be optimized to what we think of as a truth. So, so uh, what's coming out of this perfect model integration. On the top, you can see how these parameters, so the half within the tropics and the total gravity wave stress evolve with each iteration, getting closer and closer to the truth. Um, and at the bottom uh, shows you how the QBO period and the and the uh, QBO amplitude, which are the two outputs that we want to optimize, again getting closer and closer to the truth. Um, and this method also uses the standard deviation as well as the mean. So that's nice. So we're looking at how the uh, gravity wave pr parameters converge with each with, with each iteration. So what this ended up giving us was nine iterations of 20 ensembles each. So that's 180 MEMA integrations, which isn't too bad. The second step in this process is to build a Gaussian process emulator, which maps choices of these parameters onto the um, optimized variables. So, the, uh, so it tells you, it builds a function which tells you for a given set of half width as well as uh, total gravity wave stress, what the expected QBO period and amplitude is likely to be. And this is once again, very much cheaper than actually uh, uh, doing a bunch of forward integrations of MEMA. So we trained our emulator on 150 samples. So we had 180, if you recall, we had nine iterations times 20 ensembles. So, so that's 180. 
we trained our Gaussian process emulator on 150 samples and then tested on the, uh, the remaining 30 samples. And for a good emulator, you should get pretty good performance in that if you map the truth, so the NEMA period um, on the x-axis against what the Gaussian process emulator uh, says it should be on the y-axis, you should get a one-to-one, -one, so an x equals y line. And uh, we're doing reasonably well is what we assumed. Now that we have the emulator, the emulator can be used to see how these two things, so the uh, QBO period and the amplitude, vary with the parameters. That is what's shown up here. So this is a contour plot of the QBO period um, versus these two parameters, so the half width on the x-axis and the uh, total gravity wave stress on the y-axis. Again, this did not involve that many forward integrations of NEMA, so that's pretty nice. Uh, the, the Gaussian process emulator, in addition to predicting the mean, which is shown on top, also predicts a standard deviation, which is shown at the bottom. So now that we have this, we can sample uh, parts of this distribution in which the period and the amplitude are close to what we would like them to be. So close to what we would think of as the truth. So, so the, uh, the period and the amplitude that came out of the long run of NEMA that we are considering the truth. So that's what this is, and this is done using just a standard walk metropolis using MCMC. Um, and you can watch the MCMC progress around this, this distribution, and if you pay attention to it, it seems to be building up sort of like what I think of as a banana shape. I don't know how else to describe it. So this is something, um, a parts of this, this, this distribution in which the period is sort of approximately 24 months and the amplitude is approximately 27 meters a second. Um, and that's what came out of the truth of NEMA, the, the long integration of NEMA that we are considering the truth. Using that, we can plot a 2D posterior distribution. That's what this is. Um, again, we've got half width on the x-axis and the total gravity wave stress on the y-axis. And this is plotting out this, what I call a banana shape. So this is the part of the distribution of parameters in which the period of the QBO and the amplitude of the QBO are roughly in the, in the neighborhood of what we would want them to be. Also plotted here is um, a, 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 a conditional distribution, so 1D if you uh, integrate across the other axis. Um, the blue here is, I should have mentioned before, that we start with a log normal prior because all of our parameters have to be constrained to be positive. So that's what um, the blue is. This is our prior distribution. The green is the truth, so the, the long integration of NEMA. And the sort of dark gray uh, uh, um, histogram plots at the back is the inferred posterior distribution. Um, in the case of the total gravity wave stress, in particular, you can see that the posterior distribution is actually quite narrow, so it's squashed in compared with our uh, prior. And this is probably telling us that there's only a pretty narrow range of total gravity wave stress that gives us something like a reasonable QBO in the tropics. So um, we can now sample from this posterior distribution and do more forward runs of NEMA if we would like in order to put um, uncertainty bounds on, on projections. Um, Laura also has some really interesting results on the CO2 response in this context, uh, but they're really very, very new from last week. And so I thought I would, um, I thought we should mull them a little bit more before, uh, be, uh, before talking too much about it. But um, um, I think it's a pretty powerful approach. So uh, Laura has a paper in prep on this, and we would really appreciate any input or any um, constructive feedback on any of this at any point. This is, again, very, very new stuff. So both of these approaches that I've presented thus far, making a completely data-driven gravity wave parameterization, as well as using an existing parameterization, but including estimates of, 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 of uh, parametric uncertainty um, in our, in our uh, climate change model. Ultimately, we would like some element of observations in all of these situations. So we would like to train WaveNet on something that is not 8099, but rather something that includes observational estimates of uh, gravity wave drag, or perhaps high resolution simulations, or indeed some combination of the two. And uh, we're moving in that direction. And I thought I would show you just a little bit about some of some, some very new, this is, this is purely observations, which is something that I've never been involved with prior to this. 
Um, and this is uh, Project Loon. So Loon came out of Google X. Um, their Loon and they were Loon LLC, and they were they were putting these balloons into the upper atmosphere, so the upper troposphere, lower stratosphere, in order to provide cheap internet to everyone below the balloons. Um, they have about a thousand balloon flights uh, starting off in 2013. They closed down uh, last year. I think um, I'm not exactly sure what happened, but um, so that's a pretty long period of observations. And uh, it's important to note that these are this this is not a scientific ballooning campaign, and so there's periods when the uh, sensors cut out, and there's periods of maneuvering when the uh, balloons are moved up and down and things like that. And um, this is not a scientific ballooning campaign. Um, there have been scientific ballooning campaigns in the past, but they've usually been of the order of 10 to 20 balloon flights. And they've been, as you can imagine, very expensive for the agencies that have been involved with them. Uh, Project Loon is not a scientific ballooning campaign. However, it gives us pretty much global coverage. I'll show you in uh, just a minute. And they just happened to measure things like latitude, longitude, height, temperature, and pressure, but they did so every 60 seconds. So we thought that this was a really fantastic new opportunity to put observational constraints on gravity wave motions in the upper atmosphere. Um, so here is the coverage of the balloons. This is color coded by month. So going from January in red down to December, um, I guess also in red, that doesn't make sense. But anyway, so this is um, this is all of the flights. Uh, this is all of the this is the geographical distribution and the seasonal distribution of all of these flights from Moon. Uh, my former postdoc Eric Lindgren wrote the first paper on this a couple of years ago now, where he looked at the spectra of uh, gravity wave motions, how they vary across different latitudes, how they vary between the two different phases of the QBO. Um, it's a nice observational paper that required really a lot of patience on Eric's part, and I do encourage you to check that out as well. But the point here is that Loon provides pretty much global coverage. Um, there were countries that would not have these balloons in their airspace, and you can sort of guess what the countries are from looking at this plot. But it's still uh, a greater geographical coverage as well as seasonal coverage than any scientific ballooning campaign to date. And so we are hoping that, that it will give us really high resolution observational constraints on uh, gravity wave motions. Uh, my postdoc Brian Green is working. Sorry, was there a question? Yeah, I was just remarking you call that global, but um, what really is striking well, is it's southern hemisphere and over the oceans, which is huge in itself. That's all. Thank you. Indeed, yes. So they were launching from New Zealand for a period of uh, five years, I think 2013 to maybe 2016 even, and uh, that's where the extensive uh, Southern Ocean coverage comes from. Um, it's it's more, well, let, I'll get back to my talk and then maybe we can talk more later. Um, so here's uh, uh, my postdoc, Brian Green, um, has been working on extracting momentum fluxes using a wavelet analysis from these thousands of balloon flights. And this is what the average picture of, of uh, momentum fluxes looks like. Um, again, it's not quite global, but uh, uh, so, so this is what the average picture looks like in uh, boxes of five degree latitude by 10 degree longitude. Uh, you can see some pretty high values over the Southern Ocean. You can see really high values over the Andes over there. And um, here's a PDF of what this looks like at the bottom. So this is the total momentum flux versus the probability of occurrence of these fluxes. Um, the distribution is log normal, much like has been observed on uh, previous balloon campaigns. And Brian is also playing around with trying to attribute these different momentum fluxes to different sources. And just as a start, he came up with a mask for the orography. So uh, in places where there's really high orography, um, you apply a land mask, and if you try and separate them this way, um, well, you can clearly see that um, much of the Antarctic orography really, really shows up, and it's. Uh, we also think it's a bit more intermittent in regions of high orography. But here's the PDF again. The red is the orographic distribution, and the blue is the non-orographic distribution. This is again average across the globe. But if you're interested in a specific region, I mean, do send us an email, and we'd be happy to uh, to talk to you about that. So the orographic distribution has a longer tail, 
The non-orographic distribution we think has a longer tail than results from the Concordia RC campaign, which was off the order of a dozen uh, a dozen or so balloon flights. But um, but we are thinking that that is because the Concordia RC campaign was further forward um, than these balloons, which are sort of more over the jet, over the uh, southern ocean. So these are just some snapshots from these uh, from these flights. But uh, Brian is messing around with all kinds of things in terms of phase speeds and possible sources of these uh, gravity waves and so on. And so I, this, this, this is a really great time to reach out and let us know if there's something that you're specifically interested in, in terms of these uh, uh, lunar momentum fluxes or indeed anything else, um, eddy kinetic energy or whatever you care about. And we'd be very happy to talk to you um, and share data uh, on any of these things. So it's 1147. Um, okay. Uh, let me just introduce this project just over 30 seconds. Um, I think I'll skip the last bit of my talk and then just open it up to questions. So I just wanted to tell you about this really exciting new um, international interdisciplinary collaborative project that we have embarked upon. We call it Data Wave. It's not really an acronym; doesn't stand for anything. But it's an international consortium, um, including uh, there's four PIs in the US and four of us outside the US. Um, it's run out of Stanford. Uh, we have people from end of so Joan Alexander um, is uh, collaborating with us from NWRA. We've got people from Rice and NYU, the Met Office, LMD, uh, the MPI, and Frankfurt in Germany. And the idea is that we want to put together observations, so uh, balloon observations as well as high resolution simulations, including global two kilometer simulations and uh, local, so regional wharf simulations uh, in different parts of the world. And we also want to include data informed methods. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly how to, what my informed view on ML and data informed methods is after this initial foray that I that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, and I'm happy to talk more about any of that. But uh, we want to basically throw everything we can at this problem to attempt to come up with an observationally constrained as well as physically meaningful uh, gravity wave parameterization for a somewhat coarse resolution global climate model. So if you if you've got a model that's 100 kilometers by 100 kilometer grid spacing, um, how do you include uh, an observationally constrained as well as physically meaningful representation of the sources as, as well as the propagation and breaking of these uh, gravity waves. And what effect does all of that have on uh, climate variability? So the jets, the polar vortex in our current climate, as well as in a changing climate. So uh, I encourage you to check us out. Here's our website. Um, it seems like we're always looking for PhD students and postdocs and even undergraduate researchers, and we would really love to hear from you. I wanted to tell you about one other piece of work, which I was excited about, which I have been excited about because it's something I've been working on. Um, but um, I think I think I'll just wrap up my talk, and it can be all about gravity waves. And um, I'll thank you for your attention, and I'm very very happy to take questions. Thank you. If you have any questions, um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself now, or if you don't have a microphone, you can type it out in the chat, and I'll read it out loud. I think there's one in the chat. Oh, I don't. I don't have a. I don't have a question in the chat. I mean, you you can feel free to read it and answer it. Oh, Ellen. Ellen, Ellen has her hand raised too. I don't see it anymore. It it kind of popped up on my screen and then disappeared. Little one in the chat. Can you hear me? Oh, I, I see it now. I see it now. But Ellen, um, Ellen, you can go ahead and, and. Okay, I was I was just gonna say thank you so much for this really fascinating talk. And like Mike Evans, I was really struck by the. Uh, by the southern hemisphere and ocean uh, concentration of observations from Loon. And quite curious about, you said that Loon had stopped about a year ago. Is there, as far as you know, any possibility that it will start back up again or that there will be some follow on either from industry or from the scientific community to continue to uh, develop that quantity and quality of data? Right, so I don't believe that Google might be interested in following on. Um, I 
don't quite know exactly why they shut it down, presumably because it wasn't profitable after many years. And uh, uh, it's, I, they weren't doing it to give me data. They were doing it uh, for, their own pur uh, uh, for their own purposes. But I um, am aware of at least two companies that are uh, doing something rather similar. One is based in the Bay Area, which is why I sort of got to know about them. And they are launching balloons um, I think in an effort to improve hyperlocal forecasts, I'm in touch with them. Um, I haven't managed to get hold of any data from them yet. Uh, and, and I was intrigued because they had data over Western Europe, which is something that I don't have from Loon. Yeah. Um, but they're being rather slow in terms of responding to my email, so I'm not quite sure exactly what's happening. There are at least a couple of them, and I'm happy to send you an email with some contacts and so on. Um, but I am not aware of systematic um, intended follow-ups that's quite on the scale. Yeah, and uh, the quality of the data you said, uh, you know, it's questionable. <laughs> um, a large, I think I'd say about 30% of the pressure data that we have from Noon is not usable. Uh, but but the GPS measurements are, of course, accurate, and we can back out um, wins from that. So yeah. we've been playing around mostly with that. Yeah. Thank you so Hi. much. Hello. 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 Yes. Yeah, I can see the problem with the moon measurements. You know, we have uh -huh. collaboration as well. I put in two questions in the chat. Okay. Can you read that? Um, not when I'm sharing my screen, I think I can read it out loud. I see it. Out. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's, here's the questions that he asked. He said, do you see that satellite observations can be useful for your GW study? And there's another one too, but I can let you answer that one first. Yes, absolutely. So I should have mentioned that we're attempting to include satellite observations as well as lunar observations, um, in, in our observational constraint aspect of the work. Okay. Well, we have a lot of satellite observations, and we do mm -hmm. see gravity waves uh, from time to time. But the question is, how big the waves you are observing? And we, for example, during a volcanic eruption, we see big waves, and uh, we oh, have yeah. different sounders, microwave, infrared, and uh, all kinds of measurements. Indeed. So uh, I was I was listening to some fascinating talk recently about the um, uh, Tonga Tonga. Am I saying that right? Eruption and the gravity waves that resulted. So yes, uh, satellites are great. Um, the hope here was that Loon captures a bit more of the spectrum in terms of um, the um, shorter waves. The um, yeah. So the hope is to put together. Both satellite observations and uh, balloon observations. There, there's some some observations also from commercial aircraft, I believe, which I haven't um, had the chance to look at myself. But, but yes, there, there's researchers at Bath that have a bunch of papers on uh, uh, commercial aircraft observations as well. So that may that may be another source. Okay. The second part of the question you mentioned that you're using WaveNet. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is how is a computational requirement is a is a really so that's a great question um and we've been wrestling with reviewers on that paper but uh so the thing about using ml methods that, that are written in fortran um is that the hope ultimately is that uh climate models will be run on gpus and if that happens then I do not expect the computational expense to be um, to be prohibitive. At the moment, WaveNet, which is so, if we bring the complexity of WaveNet down and we do some pruning and things like that, and only um, yeah, so so the the best version that we can come up with at the moment slows down MIMA by a factor of two, which of course is unacceptable. No no climate modeling group is going to put in any gravity wave parameterization which slows down the entire model by a factor of two. That's not going to happen. But um, I think that there are ways forward on that which are perhaps beyond the scope of a single research group, um, such as running on GPUs. Um, I think, of course, uh, the ML method itself 
can be sped up in a number of ways. And crucially, the coupling between the Fortran and the Python, I think, is another issue that requires sort of uh, professional input that is beyond the scope of, you know, me and my PhD student. Uh, and, and, and I think there's some hope forward on that because the same people that are funding this project um, that is now up on my, up on my um, screen share uh, has also set up an institute for computing in climate science, which is based at the University of Cambridge in the UK. So uh, we have been talking with some purely computational people uh, to, to see what can be done in terms of speeding up WaveNet coupled with MIMA. Um, so I, I, I think that this is sort of initial steps and uh, there, there's ways of making it more computationally feasible as well as training it on um, a diverse set of uh, data sources. So excellent question. I guess it was a long answer and not a particularly, um, well, it, it wasn't a compelling answer for now, but we're working on it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you for your interesting talk. Um, asking about the uh, QBO, um, the uh, procession of the QBO, uh, the phase shift between easterlies and westerlies, and, and vice versa, uh, the downward yeah. propagation. Um, from what I remember long ago from my PhD coursework, dynamics coursework, uh, the shift from easterlies to westerlies are due to Kelvin waves, I think, and then the vice ver the westerlies, easterlies are due to Rossby waves or vice versa. Is that still the understanding? And if so, which um, sort of transition does the gravity wave parameterization operate on? And then, or does it, op does it work on both of the transitions? And if it doesn't, if it doesn't work on both, cause the, uh, both transitions to occur, what causes the non-gravity one to occur? I guess the Rossby waves, are those resolved or? Right, so, um, so this model resolves Rossby waves, uh, and the only thing that is parameterized is gravity waves. This, of course, there's a whole zoo of waves in the tropics, uh, but we think the crucial component to get a spontaneous QBO, so, so most models actually don't have a spontaneous QBO even now, uh, it, it has to be nudged towards a QBO, but the ones that do have a spontaneous QBO um, have paid some attention to their uh, gravity wave parameterization in order to have it have a spontaneous QBO. And so, um, so that was sort of the motivation for looking at the uh, gravity wave parameterization as well as sort of the features of the QBO as the things that we want to optimize in terms of the output. So we think that in this model, um, the Rossby waves are resolved and it's the gravity waves that have to be parameterized, which uh, and and they we think are responsible for for the onset of both the easterly as well as the westerly phases of the QBO. Uh, so it's so it's all driven by gravity wave parameterizations at least in this setting. Uh, so um, I think some of the some of the differences that we're seeing in terms of the westerly amplitude and so on could be because we chose to do the training on only one year. Uh, and I do think that if we give WaveNet a longer training data set, it might be able to do a better job. I think that was sort of your implied question, but yes, yeah. If it wasn't, let me know. Mm -hmm. No, 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 that, that's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, thank you. The, I have uh, one question is, uh, is there any relationship uh, between climate change and the gravity wave? In other words, is uh, if the temperature is cooling in the stratosphere, whether the gravity wave will be intensified or weak? Right. Um, I think the answer to that is we don't know. Well, at least I don't know. Um, the, there have been several studies into the response of the QBO to climate change, but I don't believe that there is a universally accepted mechanism um, as to what is causing those changes, uh, because it's a complicated problem. I mean, there, there's different sources of gravity waves and, uh, you know, convection could be occurring higher up, for instance, which would change the sources of gravity waves, not to mention lots of other things. So we don't know what the response of gravity wave activity to a changed climate is likely to be. Um, there's diverging responses in terms of climate model projections of the QBO. There are QBOs 
there are models that have uh, different periods, but they move in both directions. Unfortunately, there are models, I believe, that both increase the west of the amplitude and decrease the west the uh, west of the amplitude. And so, um, so that's what we're dealing with. In the context of WaveNet, I think that if you train it with sufficient data, uh, it is picking up something that is physically meaningful, but it doesn't tell you anything at all about the response of the QBO to climate change, right? It's it's just doing exactly what 8099 would have done in an altered climate. So that is all that you can say with WaveNet. Um, I think you need like a way more sophisticated parameterization to to actually project changes of the QBO or anything else that is dependent on gravity waves to climate change. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Evans has been waiting for a while, so I want to give I want to give him a chance to ask a question too. And thank you. That was ex really exactly my question. Um, so you already answered it. Thank you. Can okay. I follow, can I ask to follow on though, since I have the uh, the. Uh, the floor. Um, so in this, this figure is, is useful. So it seems like what you're saying is that the response to like a, a, a you know, a, a future radiative forcing like quadruple CO2 seems to be um, in the, uh, the, the tropical um, stratosphere and also seems to be in like the, the annular mode. So could you, could you, Go a little bit further and comment on that. Do you think that's realistic? And I, I can't tell from this because I don't know if AD ninety nine is is right. I, I can see the difference is is expressed here. Um, do we do we know like what this looks like? Um, uh, how's this compared to like a, a, a the, the appropriate quadrupled CO two experiment in say uh, I don't know your your favorite. Um, um, global um, GCM. Thanks. Right. Um, yeah, good question. Um, so, 8099 coupled with MEMA is doing exactly what AM4 or CM4 would do. So, it's it's complicated enough that it is like GFDL's most complicated model. Um, that being said, I think my favorite way of thinking of these things isn't so much what are the models doing, but what makes sense. So I would expect that the jets would both move, uh, well, the tropospheric jets would both move forward as well as intensify a little bit under climate change because the equator to pole temperature gradient would be intensified at least aloft and um, a, a stronger jet is a forward shifted jet. The two go together. That's how the eddy feedbacks appear to operate. So that bit is physically meaningful to me. Uh, the other thing that I would expect in the stratosphere is that I would expect a cooling and so an intensified, um, a stronger polar vortex, at least in midwinter. Uh, I do not have as basic of an understanding of how disturbed the polar vortex is going to be uh, in terms of are there going to be more or less sudden warming events? I don't know because that's driven by wave forcing from the troposphere. And I think it's a little harder to think of wave forcing from the troposphere changing in a different climate because I think there's more things that set that than just the equator to pole temperature gradient. Um, so the long story short, I think that uh, um, MIMO coupled with 8099 has a somewhat meaningful extratropical response to CO2. Um, the tropical response to CO2 in terms of the QBO particularly, I don't understand at all because I don't think that there is um, either good mechanistic understanding or a consensus, a consensus across models. Um, yeah, so it's so it's so so the GFDL models response, the QBO response to CO2 is about as good as any other um, models, like sort of uh, state of the art models response to CO2, and um, and WaveNet is capturing 8099's response to CO2. That's, I think that's all that can be said. But it does look like from this picture that um, the, that tropical jet is um, is lower altitude. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's the, like the main feature, yeah. Absolutely, and there's and there's this easterly blob that shows up um, at, I don't know, 
between <laughs> 10 and 1 hectopascal or whatever. Um, yeah, I don't think we understand what that is or why that's coming about. Uh, but this was sort of an experiment to see if we could train WaveNet on a limited amount of data, uh, which was, you know, a year of output and see how well it does. I, I do think that if we trained it on the full phase of the QBO and perhaps a restarting of the QBO, it might do even better. Fascinating. It sounds like you're on the way to figuring it out. Thanks. I mean, I'm making it sound like that. <laughs> Okay, there's two more questions um, in my queue if you're up for it. Awesome. So, Mark Liu, you you can you can have the floor. You there? See his hand is up. Oh. I, I need to take off. I already asked the question. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's, yeah. fine. That's fine. So then I have um, Dwai Sistano asked a chat question. He asked. On the first slide, what is the satellite and the date that captures gravity waves very clearly? The date? Uh, I don't <laughs> think I know. Um, let me go back to, did you mean this one? Uh, Dwight, you can turn on your mic if you have one. So this is ECMWF, so it's not explicitly satellite. Um, and I don't know which satellite and what date this was, I don't think. The first um, slide, please, the cover was, page. He was asking about the cover page, yeah. Oh, the cover page. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that I do have. I can. I think that's the hurdles. Um, it was a Japanese satellite, I think. Um, but if you give me a few minutes after the talk, I can look it up. <laughs> sorry, I don't remember. Okay, do we have any other questions? Himawari, is that what I mean? The Japanese satellite? Maybe that's that's what it was. Well, I think you might be free to look it up now because I'm not seeing any other questions oh, okay. um, unless anyone wants to interrupt me. Um, but I'll just go ahead and, and finish up. Thank you to everyone for attending for this very lively Q&A and thank you so much to our speaker for talking to us from, from California. That's pretty wonderful. So. Uh, please, everyone, return next week. Um, we have a normal schedule um, one week from today, same time, another online seminar. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we'll send you the link of your um, video recording soon after we got it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank and you. I won't, thank you. I won't close the uh, If you wanted yeah. to chat, I, I won't close the, the event right away if you wanted to, to look that up. For, oh, they they left. Okay. <laughs> I think it was in Hawaii, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, if anyone contacts me and and for your info for that information, I'll I'll just follow up. Please do follow up with you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Have a great day, everybody.